so let's talk about how that cortex is organized. And this is kind of a very typical diagram that you see, you know, in the popular press that you can kind of organize different parts of the brain in terms of their basic functionality. Uh, so, of course, Homer Simpson really thinks about certain things most of all and a lot of things not at all. And so you might imagine that different parts of his brain are specialized for these different functions. The truth is that it's actually a, a bit more complicated and it's kind of an interesting story. Um, there are specializations in the brain. There's different parts of the brain that really do different things. On the other hand, there's a lot of continuity in what different brain areas do. There's also a lot of plasticity. And so, for example, we know from people who suffer from strokes that if you kind of lose a certain chunk of your brain tissue, other parts of the brain can come in and, and take over that role. And this will be consistent with what we understand in the learning chapter, that really the unique thing about the cortex is that all of it is learned. Unlike those subcortical areas, which start out you know, with these kind of genetically coded patterns of wiring, the cortex has some genetic pre-specification of overall patterns of connectivity, but as far as we know, it really is kind of plastic. It's, it's something that learns from the bottom up, from experience to do what it knows how to do. And you see this developmentally, transitions from being governed by these subcortical systems, which in many ways are actually pretty smart in some ways, uh, those then transition back to kind of being controlled by these cortical systems. And when that transition happens, you actually get these interesting regressions that, uh, that you know, whereas the kid used to be kind of smart in recognizing faces, now they're actually worse at recognize, recognizing faces until the cortical system catches up. And so there are there is a cost associated with having everything being learned, but the, the benefit is that then you can kind of be much more flexible and adaptive and learn to uh, encode information in many different ways. And really the, the power of human survival and adaptability is all about this kind of ability to adapt to different situations. And that's a function of the fact that our overall everything that we do is learned in that cortical system. Let's follow the trail and what we can do here to understand the organization of the cortex is by tracing essentially the influence of these anchor points, uh, which are the places where sensory information enters into the cortex and also motor information exits from the cortex. And so V1 is the classic primary visual cortex. It's called area 17 also. We'll see that in a second. Um, and it is where information from your eyeballs goes into the thalamus and from the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus heads up into this primary visual cortex. And, and most of the occipital lobe in the very back of your head is devoted to processing that visual information. And so that diagram that we just saw with the hierarchy of different visual areas, V1, if you remember, was that lowest level that really is just a huge amount of brain tissue devoted to detecting all these little oriented edge detectors. Uh, and as far as we know, that's pretty much what it does. Um, it does that you know, at, at a very large scale. And it takes a lot of neurons to do that. But as a result, it's kind of compressing this huge amount of visual information into a much more compact systematic encoding of our visual world. And then from there, you can kind of trace, again, following this trail, trace how that visual information kind of radiates out into different parts of the brain. And so if you take this kind of southern route uh, from V1 down into the temporal lobe, so named because it's on your temples, the side of your head here, you get in information about different types of objects in the world. Uh, and that's, that's the primary function going down into what we call this ventral visual pathway, the infratemporal lobe, that with the bottom part of the temporal lobe, um, very conveniently, if you know the name, IT is infratemporal, um, and that's it. That's where it happens, the recognition of different objects.
Um, it's a little poetic naming there. You also have in temporal lobe at the superior part, the top of, of the temporal lobe, uh, primary auditory cortex. And if you think about kind of triangulating or interpolating between what you can see and what you can hear about, that's this kind of real nexus of language. Language, at least as it's first acquired, is really focused on naming objects in the world. And so, you know, having this speech auditory modality, which is how most people acquire language, um, enables you to connect, connect up the words associated with different objects that you're seeing. And so it makes a lot of sense that kind of language forms in that interstitial region between uh, auditory and visual inputs. And then if you kind of continue that process uh, and think about kind of more abstract levels of objects, it's kind of all the other kind of high level knowledge about the world, semantics, like what, 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 is, what is a lawyer? What is truth? What is justice? You know, these high level kind of semantic things that are much more abstract and go beyond very particular concrete objects. Those seem to be encoded up in this higher level uh, temporal pole, this very front part of the temporal lobe. And then if we wrap down underneath into the medial temporal lobe, so going down past the, the object representations and, and wrapping around into the middle part, um, there, that's where the hippocampus is. And, and so we think that that's very much important for encoding episodes. And a lot of what we think about, like, you know, the daily events of life is encoded in terms of like, who was there? Uh, what was there? What happened? You know, all these basic who, what, where, you know, when kind of type of facts um, is what that temporal lobe is important for encoding. And so when we tell stories and we, and we think about uh, different, uh, you know, events that happen. Um, all of that is kind of linguistically encoded in terms of our language ability. And really your temporal lobe is critical for encoding all that deep kind of knowledge about the world. And it turns out also that the temporal lobe is the part of the brain that we're most consciously aware of in part because of the critical role that language plays in our ability to understand the world and, the, and our ability to organize the world and our ability to communicate what we know to other people. All of that kind of ties together this knowledge in the temporal lobe and makes it very kind of consciously aware. Uh, if you think about what happens up here in the parietal lobe, often these things are actually not so consciously accessible, sort of a, a kind of you know unknown territory in our brains to some extent. And this is where uh, this same kind of visual information. Now, instead of getting mapped kind of into the auditory domain and thinking about different objects and names, is mapped into action. And this is really the primary way of understanding what happens in the parietal lobe, is it's taking all this rich visual information and using that to guide our ability to, for example, reach for objects in the world, act in the world, navigate through space, um, and understand all the kind of more continua that are associated with that. So space and time, and then interestingly number um, are all these kind of uh, more kind of abstract concepts that have to do with uh, these kind of things that, that exist in can kind of not discrete uh, form, but more continuous form. Um, and those continua are also harder to kind of uh, pin down and to describe linguistically. Um, and that may be also why we're less kind of consciously aware of those aspects of things. So when you learn how to ride a bike and you learn how to ski or snowboard, um, all those things that you kind of know how to do really involve very much that parietal lobe pathway. And again, this kind of notion that it's very hard to teach people how to do those kinds of different sports or skills is very much consistent with this idea that we're not really consciously aware of it. It's hard to describe. Okay, what you do, you just do it. You do it like this. Yeah, that's how you do it. That's not a very good way to teach stuff, but that's kind of our level of conscious access to these things. So S1 is primary somatosensory cortex. This is all the feeling of touch, also very much important uh, a sense of kinesthetic information, like where our different limbs are, uh, where our body is in space. Um, and that's very important for controlling our subsequent motor actions. 
And so this kind of pathway going into somatosensory and motor cortex then leads up into the frontal lobe. Okay, so motor cortex is kind of the anchor point for the frontal lobe and the frontal, frontal lobe is fundamentally about action. Uh, and so in our context of our core principles, the most important of which is control, frontal lobe is critical for control. That's a general way of, of understanding what the frontal cortex does. But more specifically, it's important for planning, sequencing all those individual motor actions over time, making decisions about what it is that we're gonna do. Um, and then that brings in all these other critical variables in terms of affect and motivation. And so that's the other critical aspect of the frontal cortex is this kind of anchor point uh, coming back into the medial and ventral areas of the frontal lobe that are really important for uh, encoding all of our rich emotional, affective, motivational world. Um, so all those things are, are really important for deciding what is it that we're gonna do, right? There's so many things you could do. The question is, what do you feel like doing? What, what, what are you motivated to do? Uh, that, that critical role of motivation and feeling is tied up very much with this higher level, more abstract uh, function of the frontal cortex in, in planning and control. And we'll see that as a theme going forward, that motivation is so critical for understanding intelligence and differences in what people pursue. Um, and, and so, you know, understanding how the frontal lobe integrates all those different functionality, uh, all those different aspects of, of control are, is a really important topic. So amazingly, that's it, right? So if you have the ability to kind of, you know, act in the world and plan things and pick sensory information and organize it for executing motor behavior, you have the ability to sort of uh, organize uh, and decide on what it is that you want to do. And you have these high level uh, encoding of the world. So you know kind of what is out there, what are the important concepts what are the ideas kind of guiding and, and informing our behavior? Uh, what has happened in the past in terms of this episodic memory? All of that is kind of, you know, everything that your, your brain subsumes. And we do think that it's possible to, to understand kind of all the different areas. Again, any one area kind of integrates a lot of different information. Neurons in each area of the brain are receiving inputs from lots of different brain areas. And so this picture of kind of putting these labels on different parts of the cortex is a simplification. It's a compression of what these brain areas are actually doing, but it gives us a useful sense of kind of how things are distributed. And certainly when you do have, you know, damage to different parts of the brain, uh, if you have damage in frontal lobe, you do have difficulty kind of uh, guiding uh, your overall behavior in a task driven way. If you have damage to front to this temporal pole, you have loss of understanding of these more abstract concepts. And certainly if you have damage to the, to the visual cortex, you actually end up with something called a scotoma, this inability to kind of see in a particular region of space. So uh, all these functions do have some degree of localization in addition to kind of also being kind of gradients and, and, and being distributed. And, and so much of the literature of neuroscience and psychology is devoted to understanding that kind of continuum of distributed function also in the context of having at least some specialization.